sounds pretty reasonable. I mean, five seconds, uh, that's a lifetime for me to actually get the thing. So, you know, I mean, that's one, two, three, oh my god! This is the nerdiest Mission Impossible ever. Hey everybody, welcome back to Wicked Geekdom. Gio here, and yeah, my favorite type of video on this channel, aside from hauls and all that fun stuff, is actually talking about all the seasonal anime that I've been watching. I really enjoy going week by week with my different shows instead of binging and all that nonsense. I like the thrill of new shows and discovering hidden gems, uh, possible failures, and just outstanding a plus material but nonetheless we're here to discuss the winter 2021 anime season which was jam-packed usually you get like five stellar shows and the rest is just okay here i i mean i didn't even watch everything there were a lot of shows to choose from and i had to skip on some like uh reincarnated as a slime season two which i'd love that show but i am actively reading collecting the manga so i'm doing it uh that route instead of watching the show but eventually i'll come back and watch it and see uh how closely it resembles its light novel and manga counterparts but yeah we're here to talk about all the shows that i've been watching uh, I believe the final tally is 25 different shows, which is a lot for me. A lot of shows had very strong uh, beginnings and they just sort of lost their way midpoint and ended kind of meh, if that is a proper way to describe it. And also we had a lot of cool shows debuting at the same time from, you know, stuff like uh, Attack on Titan Final Season Part 1, or, you know, Beastars Season 2, Slime Season 2, The Promised Neverland Season 2, you catch on. There were a lot of sequels to shows that a lot of people were heavily anticipating. So let's get started. Also, quick notice, I, I have my laptop here, so you'll have to forgive me if I'm looking to the side here with all the info. But nonetheless, for real, let's get started. <laughs> Mondays, I started off uh, streaming Suppose a Kid from the Last Dungeon Boonies Moved to a Starter Town. That is the name of the show. It's based on a light novel and a manga, and it tells the story of a young, wholesome kid named Lloyd Belladonna, who is, uh, his only goal is to get stronger. He wants to be a stronger kid. He's really nice, and the quirk about this show is that he is part of a... Uh, what many people consider uh, sort of like this mythical town that may not really exist, this um, uh, dungeon town that's on the last frontier of the map, if you will. The catch here is that everybody living in that town is extremely strong and overpowered. It's sort of like uh, villagers on the final level of an RPG, stuff like that. So Lloyd is extremely powerful. He moves to the main city where all the other main characters are going to meet him and they're just surprised and uh, in shock at how powerful he is and he doesn't, he's not aware, he's a very humble kid, he's not, um, you know, he doesn't notice the difference in strength between him and like the royal military and all that stuff and how much of a gap there is. And overall, it has a very strong uh, premise, especially that long-ass name, but it relies heavily on it being sort of a parody of isekai tropes without actually being an isekai. Uh, you know, you have all these characters, uh, the main character being 
distinct compared to every, everybody else, and he gets into this new place, uh, this new world, if you will, but it's actually the same place, just uh, a different town, basically, and that is played for comedic relief. The story itself is nothing too groundbreaking, aside from a couple of uh, interesting characters like Marie, which I hope I'm pronouncing right, voiced by Ai Kayano. She's one of my favorite voice actresses. Uh, she's just amazing in every comedic role that she does. And to me, she saved this show from being okay to being like, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm into this. Unfortunately, uh, the rest of the cast, there are some very trope heavy characters that don't really do much. Uh, this show is done, and I believe I'm saying the name right, uh, Liden Films. Uh, they animated this adaptation, and you're going to be hearing about them a lot throughout this video because they are doing a lot of shows in 2021. And for the most part, I guess they were trying to replicate the art style from, uh, or the illustrations from the light novel and the manga. But for the most part, the art was just kind of okay. Some of the episodes really look nice with a nice... Um, palette cleansing backdrop and all that stuff because it's a fantastical town and all that but most of the episodes just really dip in quality where i was just scratching my head thinking i kind of want to watch something else and that is a theme throughout this video as well because this series starts out uh cute and funny and midway i just kind of lost interest and wanted to watch uh, all the other shows that i was streaming uh, but yeah, nonetheless, uh, if you're if you want to watch something a little bit more lighthearted, uh, maybe a, an isekai for beginners, uh, that type of scenario. Uh, suppose a kid from the last dungeon boonies moved to a starter town might be the show for you. Next up from Liden Films, they also adapted the series Other Side Picnic. This is another show that had a lot of potential and somewhere along the way, maybe like episode six or something, I really lost interest in everything that was happening. This is sort of a, uh, it's based off a manga, Ura Sekai Picnic, and it follows two girls that are able to access this alternate plane of existence that is around us but not it doesn't interact with us uh think uh like the movie and book uh annihilation how they're able to uh cross this area where is uh like it's not an alternate dimension it's the same earth just on a different side view plane if that makes any sense uh you have the character of sorawo and she is saved by Toriko, and the relationship between these two girls is fundamental to the whole show. Um, it's very cute, and I loved their relationship and how it grows throughout the series, but it, it has such a really nice premise that they can find this alternate plane, if you will, and a lot of Japanese urban legends and stuff that you would find online and stuff from folklore and all that is inhabiting this world the monsters uh like spirited away type creatures and they don't explore that to the extent that i would have wanted to instead they just focus on select uh things that happen like lady hakushu i think i said that right with her huge hat tall creepy scary lady um stuff like that where I would have wanted a deeper exploration into that realm. Uh, there's a mystery because Toriko's friend has been missing, so that's why she's there looking for her. Meanwhile, Sorawo uh, sort of just wanted to end everything and abandon all, and she was uh, basically almost lost in that place until she was saved, and out of that, this relationship blossoms. Um, I, I don't know, it has a very interesting uh, visual key, but the animation just flip-flops throughout the entire episodes where one episode it looks nice and the premise is pretty interesting, then the other is just 
wholeheartedly disappointing. So it's very different from what Linen Films is was doing with the Boonies anime. This one looks a lot better, but it's still very inconsistent, in my opinion. Finally, Black Clover ended. I have been loving Black Clover. The story is phenomenal. I, I love that manga. I love that anime. It's a little bittersweet to see it end because it's a long-running shonen. I've been watching the show since, I want to say, early 2019 is when I first started watching Black Clover. Art inconsistencies made it kind of notorious online compared to other shonen jump properties that got the anime treatment like Bleach, Naruto, One Piece, etc., etc. But that sort of stayed all throughout the series. And while, yes, the final 16 episodes that aired did a wonderful job of adapting uh, easily the best part of the manga so far, uh, or my favorite part so far, uh, it, it's there were some stills that <laughs> just, they, they uh, oh man. But nonetheless, the actual story itself is awesome. I love the... Uh, the whole demon arc and all that, and Asta's progression, and finding, finally, tapping into the source of his power with the anti-magic stuff, is the storyline that we've been waiting for if you've been reading or watching Black Clover. It's just unfortunate that um, Studio Piero decided to end the series adaptation. I'm pretty sure what they're gonna do is they're gonna wait a while for more manga chapters and do smaller batches of episodes, smaller arcs, so it's better adapted. Now you don't have an excuse, because if you come back and you just do one little season of 12 episodes, it better look really bitchin', you know? Unlike what we've had before, I think, what, it was 170 episodes, and I would say 85% of them looked solid. Uh, the 16 episodes, um, phenomenal, really cool stuff. Uh, some. <laughs> huge inconsistencies here and there with the art, uh, but nonetheless, I enjoyed it, and um, I am gonna miss it, because watching something, it becomes sort of your routine, you know, day by day, and each Tuesday, watching a new episode of Black Clover was something I was looking forward to um, on that particular day, and now it's not there, so it kind of just, something that's missing. <laughs> Next up is Wonder Egg Priority. In my honest opinion, this will definitely make my list of top anime of 2021. It should be on everybody's list. It is a phenomenal, beautiful, just amazingly done series that came out of nowhere from uh, Cloverworks. It's an original anime. It's not based on a manga. It is very hard to describe. I'm gonna do my best. Essentially, you follow this uh, character of I, an introverted uh, girl. She's a wholesome young girl. She's she's an introvert, so there's some dilemmas there, some psychological issues that get explored throughout. But the main plot of it all is that she is given or finds this mysterious wonder egg that essentially blends into her dreams and she's able to go into this alternate plane of existence and help out other young girls that unfortunately uh, committed suicide and help them pass on or save them. Uh, we're not explicitly told it's their soul, but it's inferred, um, or, or at least that's how I saw it. And man, this show, it, it's, I'm having a tough time describing it to everybody <laughs> watching this video, but it's such a beautifully crafted show because uh, very rarely do we get this type of production. Uh, the animation on it is beautiful. At times, it feels like I'm watching a movie instead of a 12-episode series. Now, unfortunately, Wonder Egg suffered a small hijinks. Um, one of the episodes was delayed, so they did a recap episode. That's why the finale was uh, suspended and it's airing in the summer of 2021 as a special edition episode to conclude the series. That should have been episode 12. Instead, it's the 13th episode, if you will. But still, the story's great. The relationship between I and the different girls that show up, 
the other three main girls, they're, they're all beautiful characters. They have wonderful backstories, very tragic in the case of all four. And to see them develop and form this friendship uh, while also trying to uh, complete their goals and motivations by saving the other girls and very specific individuals that they want to save because uh, the providers of these eggs are promising them that if they do these tasks that they can save a particular uh, someone that they hold dear to them that um, was lost or uh, tragically ended their lives or something like that. But yeah, there's a lot of interesting themes. There's backstories to why these caretakers are giving out these eggs. Uh, their backstory is particularly haunting and I cannot praise this show enough. Excellent story. I love when you take kooky concepts like this and you're able to just immerse yourself into this world and you're wondering what the heck am I watching? But at the same time, yes, give me more. This is sort of the nightmarish version of a uh, magical girl show mixed with the creativeness of a Satoshi Kon uh, movie, if that makes any sense. I really enjoyed Wonder Egg Priority and hopefully you can watch it. Next up is ReZero Season 2, Part 2. We finally have the conclusion. I loved Part 1. It was one of my favorite shows from 2020, and this time we go back. Unfortunately, there were a couple there were a couple of things at the beginning where I wasn't entirely on board because such a gap, a wide gap happened. I believe it was because of the pandemic and all that stuff. Um, but I kind of just forgot about ReZero, and when I came back to it, I'm like, oh, all right, we're back at the sanctuary. So yeah, <laughs> the story is fantastic, but it takes a while. I again, it's 24 episodes of these characters contained in this one spot. Occasionally, we do see other uh, places like the Roswell Mansion and stuff like that, but for the most part, it's just them and the sanctuary going back and forth uh, with the loops and all that stuff with Subaru. Nonetheless, if you like ReZero, you are going to love season two so much is explored to every single character so much development for subaru for amelia uh, for everybody it's a wonderful uh wrap up to season two i i loved it it was one of my favorite things and it will probably make my list of best of 2021 and i genuinely loved this uh part of the story <laughs> Next up is Beastars Season 2. All right, so what did I think of Beastars? I love the manga. It's one of my current ongoing, well, you know, it ended in Japan, but it's ongoing for me because the volumes are still coming out in the US. Uh, it's one of my favorite current manga that I'm reading. And uh, I watched Season 1 when it came out. And then I went back and started reading the manga. And at the time, I remember mentioning to people how the manga has its own unique art style, which is beautiful. I love that art. Paru Itagaki is just a genius. I love her use, uh, her skills at drawing the animals and the expressions and how uh, disproportionate they can be sometimes with their eyes and stuff. But the anime is done by Orange Studio. It's... Uh, you know, they're known for their heavy usage of CGI and all that stuff, and it's really, really different, the two of them. But you can enjoy them uh, separately. If you watch the anime, it, it doesn't bother you that much, but when you compare it to the manga, you're like, oh, I can see how the manga is superior. I'm not, I'm not somebody like that. I, I have no problem whatsoever watching uh, a anime of something that I've read. It's the same as watching a live action movie out of a comic book. I want to see that because it's fun. So it's the same thing with anime and manga. I'll watch it. I, I'm not this elitist that thinks like, oh, the original is always better. What's better is what you choose it to be and what you watch. That's what's better. But 
In the case of Beastars, uh, having watched season one, read, uh, I've been reading uh, the manga, and then I go back and watch season two, I'm like, yeah, this animation is kind of like, uh, it's it's missing so much flair and gusto from Padui Tagaki's art style. That uh, the story's fine, the story's fantastic, it has some really wonderful moments and character works from Legoshi and, and all the other animals. But going back and watching the anime after reading the manga is a little jarring to say the least. And they do omit certain scenes from the manga, which was a little bit weird. Some I do get, because uh, here's this another overused, um, overrated word, uh, pacing. Um, for pacing issues, you do omit certain scenes from the manga to do a tighter narrative and all that stuff, but uh, sometimes they would just scramble uh, plot points around where something would happen here, where it's supposed to go over here, and you mix it all up, and then you put a scene in the middle that goes after the stuff I was just talking about with my hand movements, my awesome ninja movements. Um, stuff like that where I went like, oh, oh okay, that's kind of weird. I, I remembered it differently in the manga. and uh, But nonetheless, it's if you loved season one, you're going to love season two. But if you can, maybe read the manga because that art style is just beautiful. But <laughs> nonetheless, it's a, it's a worthy uh, sequel to season one. Uh, they go into some really heavy stuff with the nature of, again, herbivores and carnivores and the, you know, the meaning of life and all these characters and what does it mean to uh, take a life in the case of Tim, you know, he was murdered in season one. So a lot of heavy philosophical topics are explored, but not in a way where you get bogged down by it. It's fairly entertaining and of course uh, Legoshi's a uh, wonderful transformation into this uh, amazing character continues throughout season two. Uh, when they cry, or Higurashi go, the final batch of episodes, uh, I think 14 to 24, something like that. If you don't watch uh, the original, which I have over here, the original series or play the original visual novel, you're gonna be lost because the later half of Higurashi Go is a jumbled mess. I liked it, but it's a mess. As a standalone series, I don't recommend it. In the larger context with the games and the previous shows, the uh, previous three seasons, you get enjoyment out of it. And even then, some things I, I, I had a tough time following because it's been so long since I've seen uh, Higurashi that uh, yeah I remembered like okay it's technically a reboot because you can go in blind uh, and be okay for the most part but some of the things that happen after episode 13 or so or, or even earlier I was lost I, I had no idea what was happening and I just went along with it the finale the final arc it rounds things up and you understand what's happening and what is going to go forward because at the end they do reveal that there's another series coming, uh, the sequel, in the summer of 2021 and you, you get it, you understand what's happening now, all that stuff, but there is some middle portion, especially with the military police and all that stuff, where it was just a mess and sort of the creepy unsettling vibes from the opening scenes of the show and the visual novels, to me that got lost in this show. I don't know, I, it looked great for the most part, but that sort of just went away and I was watching a uh, nice cutesy show with occasional bouts of violence sprink sprinkled throughout. <laughs> Next is probably one of the biggest disappointment in anime in quite some time. It is The Promised Neverland Season 2, a fan favorite show from, I believe, 2019, if I remember correctly. It was delayed multiple times because of the pandemic. Now we actually saw the thing and holy smokes, what the heck happened? Cloverworks, seriously. I mean, I understand that you saved your budget for, um, 
uh, Horimiya and <laughs> Wonder Egg priority, but what the actual heck happened with The Promised Neverland, where you have characters um, not making any sense, time skips, uh, creators not taking credit for the work that was done. I was just baffled. The first two episodes of the series are actually, or the season, are actually really freaking great. I love them, and I'm like, all right, I'm in. After all the crazy shit that's happened around me, I was ready for The Promised Neverland because I loved season one so much, and I, I've been meaning to read the manga, I just haven't had time, so I was really excited. After that, I started hearing, oh, the mangaka wanted to uh, use the anime sort of to create a new what-if scenario, which I don't mind. I, I, I don't mind it at all because the original will always be there and I can always go back and read it. But he makes that statement, or they make that statement, and I started hearing a lot of people upset because by episode three or four, certain characters and huge chunks of uh, plot is missing. They skip through all of that. Apparently, just wonderful characters that everybody wanted to see are absent, and it just moves forward in time, and we get this very generic revenge plot and trying to, I don't know, humanize the demons, which makes no sense when season one you didn't even really see them, and now in season two you barely... Uh, you haven't had time to see things from the other perspective to gain some sort of empathy or possible uh, to, you know, plant seeds of redemption for later episodes. None of that work is there. It just, it's so abrupt, the change between the two shows, between the two seasons, sorry. I was just baffled by it. The art is, it's okay, it's very mediocre by what was done in season one. I remember the first episodes of season one were so beautifully drawn and sort of became like this thing on the internet, right? Showing uh, people the first two episodes, the first episode and filming their reaction. Uh, but with this, it was just really mediocre in my opinion, just middle of the road. Uh, the writing makes no sense. The characters make no sense. They make some really uh, dumb choices. And by the end of it, uh, the plot gets resolved in an awkward, silly fashion. Previous villains now come back and they're good for some reason. And then the end, uh, you showed a whole season's worth of material in uh, three or five minutes of a slideshow and called it a day and ended the freaking series. I understand, it's a business and anime and manga are so linked together that one promotes the other, and I think they were upset that the manga was uh, ending, or it had ended when production started, so they couldn't promote the manga and all that stuff, so they decided to wrap things up and, and finish it, which is fine. At least do a good job at adapting a story that a lot of people were looking forward to. This is a terrible disaster that I cannot recommend to anybody. Please do not watch The Promised Neverland unless you want to be disappointed at how bad it is and instead just read the manga. Go ahead, get the Shonen Jump app for two bucks a month and read the whole thing in a month. I don't know. Just do that instead. The other one I was watching on Thursdays was Cells at Work, Code Black. The original Cells at Work, I watched season one. I didn't really have a desire to go back to season two, which also premiered, uh, because uh, it's fine. But I'd rather keep watching Code Black, because the drama's there. Whereas the other one's a little bit too clean, if that makes any sense. Everybody's so cheery and... It's all good, <laughs> but with Code Black, an unhealthy body, uh, just the toughest of luck. Uh, all the bad things that you can think of are happening to this person and seeing the body react and the blood cells and the organs and all that stuff and the drama that happens and, and goes inside of your body really reflects and makes you reflect on life and all the choices that you're making, and it makes for a much more interesting, dramatic show. Uh, I just liked it so much. And it's by Linen Films. They did uh, Boonies and um, 
uh, other side picnic, which looked kind of fantastic compared to this. This was finely crafted. I think their A team of animators uh, went to work on Cells at Work Code Black instead of the other shows. Next up, of course, is a Dr. Stone Stone Wars, or season two, continuing one of my favorite shows from recent memory, one of my favorite manga from Shonen Jump, which gets a bad rap from edgy manga tubers out there and anime tubers, or however you say it. I love Dr. Stone. I have no problem admitting that, and hey, you like what you like, right? But in the case of this adaptation, I think they really did a good job not, um, I didn't love it as much as the first season, but it's still wonderful. The Stone Wars segment of the manga, uh, they adapted it really freaking well. And of course, we finally had the best character show up, one of my favorites in Dr. Stone, the awesome Nikki. I, I really enjoy her and she's awesome. And uh, the rest of the story is just great. And seeing how, you know, the class between, um, you know, the technology, the kingdom of science and uh, Sukasa's beast physical <laughs> muscle kingdom, if you will, uh, how they go about it, this clash of ideologies and the, the just the story that booms from there is going to lead on to bigger things. We get the tease at the end with season three, which is one of my favorite things about the manga. I love it so much. Um, well, the pirate outfits and all that stuff. I'm not spoiling anything, don't worry about it. I'm really excited to see uh, some of the other amazing characters in this series. But yeah, just it was just a really solid adaptation, wonderful music and cast of characters and all that stuff. Uh, just continued the same level of production from the previous one, obviously being shorter, I think it was 11 episodes, made for a tighter narrative. Uh, you could you know, really frame everything well, and it really did the manga justice, in my opinion. Really looking forward to more animated Dr. Stone. After that, I jumped on uh, Late Back Camp Season 2, one of the most wholesome shows of all time. I remember loving Season 1 when I watched that, I think, uh, shoot, I think early 2019 is when I watched Season 1, I, I think. This just continues that charming, cute uh, story and gets even cuter and nicer with just beautiful characters just living their lives and just um, enjoying every minute of it. I absolutely loved uh, Late Back Camp Season 2. Wholeheartedly recommended. The uh, original shorts, uh, I can't remember, Room Camp, I think it was called or something like that. Uh, I didn't like that as much because it was only like five minute digest episodes, but this is much more fleshed out. There's a plot involved and most of the episodes center around a couple of things, whereas the other one just introduced, the first season introduced a lot of elements. This one is a lot um, closer, you know, in the narrative with everybody coming together for a specific goal at the end of the show and them camping out in, uh, the beautiful settings and the backgrounds in the show are just expertly drawn and just you want to go there and whenever they go to a, a new restaurant or a new uh, camping site or, and, or something you are visually intrigued and you want to jump into the screen I thought yes please take me out of this and uh, I want to go there and just uh, camp out and have fun and live life to the fullest. Fridays, I would continue watching Jujutsu Kaisen, which is a phenomenal series that a lot of people are into. And it's just this hot new show that exploded ever since episode one. It just, the hype around Jujutsu Kaisen is intense. Go to, uh, go to Twitter or specifically go to TikTok and you're gonna see so many TikToks from anime fans about Jujutsu Kaisen, it's insane. I thought it was great, uh, not, I gotta be completely honest, not my favorite out of everything that I watched, but Studio Mappa is one of my favorites. They absolutely killed it with the uh, adaptation of the manga. Um, I, I've only read the first three or four volumes of the manga, keep that in mind, but what I saw from the anime was just beautiful. Everything was awesome, the choreography with the fights, and the abilities and the story, everything is top-notch. It's just, 
the story, I don't know. I, I, I guess I was expecting a little bit more out of what I got, but it's still solid. It's still fun. You, you have a really wonderful cast of characters um, doing some really cool things. And uh, I'm going to search real time because I cannot remember the name of a character that I'm looking for. A few moments later. Kazumi Miwa. She's a goofball and I love her so much. Probably my favorite character of the show. I'm not joking. I know a lot of people are going to go with the main trio in this Yu Yu Hakusho, Naruto, Bleach inspired series, uh, but uh, Kazumi Miwa, I, I loved that character. She was such an eccentric goofball that I enjoyed her scene, especially with uh, the final fight in the clash of the tournament thing that they were doing with the schools and then the baseball game. I really enjoyed that, uh, especially that baseball episode. Next up is So I'm a Spider, So What? Uh, like with Slime, uh, there's always a shtick when it comes to Isekai. There's something that uh, sets one series apart from everything else. And for um, I'm a Spider, I, I, it's the fact that this whole class of kids get reincarnated or get transported into another world, this fantasy setting world and they are reborn as different characters. Some uh, were male uh, students, now they're female students, others are like uh, teachers, and then some characters are reborn as creatures. Uh, the protagonist is reincarnated as a spider. This type of spider has the ability to be super powerful, and throughout the first 12 episodes, it's her, uh, getting used to her new body and surroundings in this cave where she's born from a huge mother spider. And the first thing she witnesses is all the different, or all her brothers and sisters cannibalizing on each other, trying to survive. And it's a brutal world. It reminded me of that time I got reincarnated as a slime because you're taking, uh, you're taking that approach where you have a character come back as something insignificant, but she's rather or has the potential to be powerful and significant compared to everybody else. The main problem I would say with the series so far is that a lot of the times I'm more interested in watching our main character instead of the humans and whatever the heck they're dealing with with this incoming invasion of demon lords and all that nonsense. I just want to go back with some spider goodness, if that makes sense. But yeah, wonderfully animated. Hilariously voiced. I loved this series uh, and I'm currently watching the rest of the first season and it's so awesome to see. The CGI takes some getting used to but it doesn't um, it doesn't bother you that much because you know it's contained to the labyrinth dungeon. Uh, the human characters are traditionally animated with their attacks and sword fights and magic all that stuff so it's an interesting mix. Plus the animation for the actual spider uh, body looks pretty interesting. Sometimes uh, it's a nice blend of CG and uh, 2D animation that I really enjoyed. <laughs> Continuing from the fall 2020 season, uh, we have Yashahime, which uh, is a sequel to Inuyasha. I really wanted to love this. It's okay. I mean, the story is intriguing enough. It's a lot more convoluted than it needs to be. I think it could have been streamlined a whole lot better. At some points, characters are introduced that I, I was either not paying attention or I frankly didn't care that much, but some things are introduced where they make such a huge fuzz over it, where you have the original cast, you find out why they're not there, Kind of tropey, in my opinion. Uh, I would have wanted something completely different, but again, the show is just focusing on the trio of girls, specifically Sashomaru's uh, daughters. And I mean, this is an original production, and I would say a quarter of the series feels like filler content. And that's not good. That means the story's really simple, and you're just padding it out with needless filler. I was not a fan of that because it 
kind of some of the episodes were just plain boring in my opinion and when you finally touched on the central plot of the show it happens for one episode and one episode and then you go back to them recreating a famous fight uh, to please the princess of a lord stuff like that that's not necessarily the most exciting thing in my opinion uh, the animation's okay uh, and you when you see the older characters you get a real kick out of that you remember fondly uh, you know Kagome and Yasha uh, all these characters but then they go away and it's like what am I gonna do now <laughs> the three girls are fantastic I think they are really well uh, written and their interactions are really cute and funny it's just it's a very thinly drawn out show that could have been better if it was just 12 episodes uh, not filled with nonsense in my opinion following that my personal favorite show of 2020 is Dragon Quest Adventures of Die it actually is on Fridays but I tend to watch it on Saturdays uh, it's my Saturday morning show if that makes sense to you guys for all you uh, old-school animation fans uh, Dragon Quest Adventures of Dai is such an amazing uh, adaptation of the manga and a reboot of the anime. I love it so much. Dai is such a great character. He is aloof on certain topics, but for the most part, he's got your back and he's awesome and he's uh, strong-willed and he will defend you. And I, I like that. He's not this dim-witted protagonist. He, he has some smarts. He doesn't know everything. But he catches on quick, and he's very quick to uh, protect uh, his loved ones and friends and all that stuff. So I really appreciate that. Also, the story is very epic, sword and sandal style, where you've seen it before in different RPGs and all that stuff. It's nothing new. But where it, I think where it excels is elevating that story and presenting the dangers of what could happen when you have the uh, overlord villain taking over and the heroes coming to the rescue and saving the kingdom and the magic and the creature elements and of course having um, uh, Toriyama's distinct character designs present really make it a vibrant fun show expertly drawn by Toei Animation might I add this is just a <laughs> fantastic series firing in all cylinders. I absolutely love it and I look forward to it every uh, week on my schedule. I love uh, Dragon Quest and I'm so happy that they decided to animate it all the way to the end. It's not gonna stop. So right now we're on episode 28, 29, something like that. And I'm, I'm just, I'm all in. I love it so much. Saturdays were made for Horimiya. A fantastic uh, romantic comedy about these two kids with a lot of insecurities in a portrayed in a very realistic fashion getting together forming a beautiful loving relation um, and at the same time exploring the different aspects of their lives and, and supporting cast with all the uh, schoolmates in high school and all that just a, a really nice uh, show that similar to Promise Neverland uh, really omitted a lot of material from what I read online. Um, I, they skipped several volumes of manga content and basically adapted uh, a good solid portion of the main plot and the side stories for these characters and the final arc of the story. It's a little bittersweet because I, you could easily have made a season two and continue the relationship and to see how it strengthens and all the adversities and all that stuff. But I think what we got was really solid. The animation is gorgeous. I love the character designs and the art style. I love it so much. And I, I really dug that everybody had different uh, colored hairstyles, made it <laughs> fairly easy to remember the characters, which is kind of the point, actually. But um, also, one of the probably one of the negatives when it comes to Horimiya is the fact that um, you solved, you solved the main plot of the show uh, early. So you had a couple of episodes just focusing on the side characters and they're interesting, but you're leave, leaving out the main attraction. Um, they're outside of the, you know, of what you're watching with the show. 
And I don't know, it, it, it sort of lost its way. I, I would have liked to have seen it in a more traditional fashion where you have the plot sprinkled throughout the 12 episodes or 13. Instead, it just got, <laughs> the main dilemma got solved really early on. And what was left was like watching an extended epilogue and the relationship between the side characters and, you know, their budding romances and all that stuff. And then by the end, we finally go back to our main duo. And I was like, okay, thank you. Again, I would have preferred if the show would have spaced it out a little bit more throughout the season, if that makes sense. Next up is Skate Infinity, an original anime about skateboarding. It stars Reki, a high school sophomore and skater, and is addicted to S, a highly secret and dangerous downhill skateboarding race that takes place in an abandoned mine. Uh, he meets up with Langa, a transfer student returning to Japan after studying abroad to the mine, and this relationship forms with uh, Reki finding a new friend and somebody to share his passion with about skateboarding and teaching him and it's it's a really wholesome relationship that forms out of that it's uh i would say 90 percent realistic in its interpretation of skateboarding and i say 90 percent because some of the characters pull off some really crazy moves uh, that are obviously not doable in real life but you still have fun either way and the relationship between the main two guys in this series their friendship is so wholesome that bromance was so strong i actually wanted them to be a friggin couple and i was denied that uh, still it's a very fun uh light-hearted show it has some really uh, dramatic points near the end and a nice way to explore uh depression from the view of a teenager at you know high school era and all that stuff and the way he snaps back and and realizes some things that were missing uh some self-realizations and all that stuff i thought was actually kind of nice the way they handled it could it have been better yeah sure but <laughs> what we got i kind of liked it a lot i i think this is a wonderful show beautifully animated the whole anatomy of, of them uh doing their moves and skating and all that stuff is really well done it looks fresh dynamic and really vivid and that's really important when you're doing a sports themed show because that's the main appeal of it aside from the characters interacting with each other yada yada you go in for the skateboarding if you're a skateboarding fan you want to watch it for the skateboarding and it's actually really well done in my opinion. Finally, on Saturdays, I ended up uh, my adventure with Digimon the 2020 reboot, which is still ongoing. <laughs> it's like, uh, I think it's going to be close to 70 episodes total. So yeah, I'm still watching it, but it's been so much fun. The animation took a nosedive because I guess Toei is doing, you know, that they're working on Dragon Quest and One Piece and Digimon just, it's over there in the corner. But nonetheless, the stories, I love Digimon so much. It's one of my favorite franchises of all time. And to see it back in the way that it, they did is really exciting. There are some really kick-ass moments that uh, I, I was in shock at what I was watching. The reintroduction of certain Digimon uh, was fascinating. Uh, what they do with Devimon was astounding. I loved it so much. And uh, it led to some really uh, goosebump inducing moments. I, I, I loved it so much. I'm referring to uh, Greymon and Ty. And um, man, if, if you've watched it, if you know what I'm hinting at, that was some really badass stuff. Just A plus material. I do like that they're taking their time with the story, not rushing anything, and just having fun with it and taking the original story and just rebooting it in a different way. It's the same, it's almost the same story beats, but we're seeing different elements sprinkled throughout, different Digimon that weren't there in the original, now are here, different types of evolutions, different modes, and the end game is gonna be really different from what I'm watching. It's gonna be really different from the original. That is awesome, that is exciting, and, um, because if it was just a plain old reboot, I wouldn't have been uh, interested. 
But with this, I'm, I'm all in. It looks really awesome, guys. Next up on Sundays, which typically I kind of hate Sundays, but nonetheless, uh, we had Kimono Jihen, uh, easily one of the underrated shows, one that I hyped up the most and wholeheartedly recommend. It stars uh, Kohaji Inugame, this detective who's sent to investigate sort of these uh, grisly phenomenon that's occurring in a remote Japanese village where animal corpses are popping up and as he's investigating, he meets a strange boy uh, who agrees to help him with what he's doing with the case and all that stuff. And pretty soon they discover that supernatural forces are at work and the kid may be at the heart of it, but not entirely. This is a really fun show. It takes characters um, that are insecure of themselves and you have Inugami, who is this trickster that I don't want to spoil because I want you to be surprised to find out who he really is, but he takes these kids in at his office uh, to investigate supernatural stuff and the kids have a lot of insecurities and most of the episodes revolve around solving their origin or their backstories but some of the some are missing parents others are missing siblings others just want to find out who they actually are stuff like that the main character in this is kabane kusaka i hope i said that right this strange, uh, wholesome young kid, he's very blunt. He doesn't really know uh, how to socially interact with anybody. So his reactions are very genuine. And part of the comedy in this series is him trying to react to the other kids who are more modern and all that stuff. Him, and, you know, Kabane is just this uh, rural hick kid uh, trying his best. But there's this element of Japanese folklore there that is really awesome and I hope we get a season two to further explore these themes because I really loved it. The animation's nice, crisp and clean and just uh, a really uh, breath of fresh air in my opinion. <music> Attack on Titan final season. Everybody thought Oh, this is it, the final 16 episodes. As we watched the episodes, you knew it wasn't gonna be 16 episodes. Nobody knew they could adapt, uh, what was it, like six to 10 volumes of manga in 16 episodes. There's a lot to cover. I will say the hype around it was awesome and I really enjoyed that aspect. It reminded me of other, of other popular shows when they were ending and sort of that hype whenever a new episode arrived and then after it aired everybody commenting on it and then reacting and all that stuff um, i really enjoyed that i miss that that's why i like watching week to week shows you get that hype uh, whereas just binging a whole season it's kind of boring in my opinion but with attack on titan there's this huge time skip from season three and um yeah, I'm not gonna spoil everything. Uh, you gotta know that Studio Mappa took over and a lot of people were concerned because you're so used to Wit Studio's signature style, but Mappa just crushed it, man. Uh, the Titans, uh, the CGI on them is noticeable, but it doesn't distract you from the story and you have fun with it, in my opinion. Uh, the characters are great and seeing them much older, uh, this is a much more serious portion of the story, whereas the other one was more fantastical and action-packed. This goes into the whole political play and uh, that war, that chess war, if you will, of nations trying to outdo each other now that the main characters are in the global scale with everybody else. Uh, super interesting and I'm, I'm really excited. I figured when, as soon as they announced that um, final season, I always said, I always thought, oh, all right, they're gonna split it into two like they've been doing in the past with uh, season three. Um, everybody will say, no, season, the final season, 16 episodes. And then they were upset when we left off with that epic cliffhanger on episode 16. Yeah, we're gonna have to wait <laughs> next year and watch the conclusion but uh, they'll have more time to do everything right and all that fun stuff. Wow. 
Finally, I ended my Sundays with Mushugo Tensei, jobless reincarnation, the granddaddy of Isekai, the one that started a whole bunch of the tropes that we're now annoyed by or accustomed to. Depends on your point of view, right? For me, accustomed to, I would say, because I like Isekai for the most part. Some of them are really nice, others are, are pretty generic, but <clears throat> some of the tropes started with uh, Mushugo Tensei, and not a lot of people are going to be excited about it if you are sensitive to that stuff, but you have the character of Rudius Greyrat. He was originally this 34-year-old uh, in our world uh, that didn't amount to anything. He was just a slob and a uh, neat character that didn't do much in life and was pretty disgusting and a sort of a perv. Uh, the one time he actually does something, he uh, gets run over by a bus and is transported. He's reincarnated as this young baby uh, Rudius Greyrat. So you have him, uh, this 34-year-old, um, in the mind of a newborn, and he's growing up in this fantastical place with magic, warring states, and political intrigue, and uh, animal humanoid characters. Uh, can I just say, and what's the name of the people that animated this thing? Uh, Studio Bind. Studio Bind was created for the specific reason of animating Mushigo Tensei. That's some power flexing right there. You create a whole division to animate a long-running manga based on a long-running light novel series. Um, you're gonna get results. The animation on this thing is crispy clean, so tight and well put together. Everything about it is just awesome. Yeah, there's the whole aspect of Rudius being a perv because of his original self, and there are a lot of pervy situations that happen. It's sort of a older teen kind of jumping into the NC-17 area type of show, especially the beginning episodes, but you get such a wonderful world that you're watching it through Rudius' eyes. He is allowing us to learn about this place and all the world building aspects and the lore and, and the characters and all that stuff that is super fascinating to me. That's the type of show I like to watch where you have sort of this open canvas of creatures, elements, religion, war, all this stuff that you're gonna learn about. And the main character, he finally gets a second chance to better himself and be somebody of use because uh, there was that moment where, you know, at the end of his previous life where he did want to better his circumstances, if you will, and now he has the chance to do it, and you get a whole cast of characters. Uh, from Roxy, which a lot of people are fans of, she even has her own spin-off manga, uh, to, uh, of course, uh, one of my favorite characters, uh, that is Eris. I, I love that character so much, she was my favorite. And uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to uh, season two, which should be in the summer of this year. Really excited, easily. One of my favorite shows that I've watched of 2021 so far. Highly recommend Mushigo Tensei, Jobless Reincarnation. Next up on my list are a couple of shows that are just kind of out there. I I, uh, I didn't watch them in any specific way, format, date. It, I learned about them as I was closing out the other shows and I tried to watch them. Uh, one of them is Heaven's Design Team, which is based on the manga of the same name and it also includes an, own, an ONA, which is an original net animation, basically a, a digital only episode. Uh, Heaven's Design Team is basically God outsourcing uh, the animal creation to a design team, which is great. It's a very wholesome, lighthearted show, really funny. If you love animals, if you love biology, uh, trivia and science and all that stuff, you are going to love this series. Beautifully drawn, wonderful cast of characters, and the way they go about creating the animals of the world, of Earth, is really awesome and getting to, you see all the trivia behind it and how they're constructed. Uh, just a fantastically, just a fantastically written show. Uh, even the bonus 13th episode was really cute. Uh, I loved it. The opening uh, song for Heaven's Design Team is awesome. It's so catchy, I'd, I'd loved it. <laughs> Next up 
Next up is Kiyo in Kyoto from the Maiko House. This is strange. This is a monthly anime. So I've only watched two episodes. The third one is airing like a couple days from now. Uh, it's a very weird approach to a show. I thought it was gonna be, when I saw the first episode, I thought, okay, so this is like a preview, because we've seen that before. You show an episode and then you have to wait like a month to start the series. Uh, no, episode two came, watched it, and I realized, oh, this is a monthly thing. So <laughs> yeah, as of uh, April, 2021, I've only seen two episodes with the third one incoming in a couple of days. But essentially, we are following uh, the story of Kiyo um, and her friend Sumire. Uh, Sumire wants to be a Meiko or a Maiko. I hope I said that right. Essentially, a geisha in training. And uh, Kiyo isn't quite uh, Maiko material, but she is a really wholesome young girl. And she becomes the chef cook of the Mako house of all these uh, geisha in training and seeing their day to day lives, activities and all that stuff in uh, the presence of Kiyo cooking all of these delicious meals is actually refreshing and uh, a, a wonderful palate cleanser compared to everything else that I've talked so far. They, they have a nice use of uh, CG when the characters are doing heavy labor and stuff that otherwise would be kind of arduous to animate. It's done really well in this show where it blends in with the art style and sometimes you don't even notice it. The other series that I watched is Vlamp Love from the legendary Mamoru Oshii. This is an original anime uh, where you have Mitsugu Bamba, a high school girl who is crazy about donating blood and just Trust me, she's obsessed with blood. She finds out that one of the girls at the local blood bank is a vampire. So she becomes obsessed with her, befriends her, and what soon follows is this wacky, uh, I saw it in a comment on the internet, uh, it's essentially a kill the kill style comedy about vampires. There's a little bit of fan service stuff here and there, but for the most part it's just random bizarre humor that I enjoyed. Uh, I love the animation for it. Every episode is uh, all the different adventures that these characters get themselves into is really funny and interesting to see, in my opinion. Also to wrap up this video, which has gone on for way too long, is High Rise Invasion, based on the manga of the same name, and it is essentially I love this description. It's not an accurate one because there's a lot more to it, but if The Purge was in an alternate reality with skyscrapers and bridges and high school girls, you would get a high-rise invasion. Um, not necessarily my favorite thing. Uh, the animation kind of goes back and forth between I like it, eh, I like it, it's all right. But yeah, you have these characters who find themselves lost in this, um, what was it called, an ab abnormal space where skyscrapers are connected by suspension bridges and you have these people with masks who want to be gods of this place and they're out killing all the people that are being thrown into this world and our main girl, she's in high school and she's trying to figure out what the heck's going on so she's going to try and escape. but. Killing people is something that will happen. So this series has a lot of violence, uh, sexual content, nudity, fan service, and a lot of gore. Uh, but it's a very B-movie type story. And if you're into that sort of thing, sort of like a, a Robert Rodriguez, Quentin Tarantino-esque uh, B-movie stuff, you're gonna like High Rise Invasion. Not necessarily one of my favorite things, but I enjoyed it. It's the full series is out there on Netflix. You can stream all 12 episodes of the first, hopefully the first season. I, I want to see these shows continue with more episodes. Uh, but yeah, um, really interesting. High Rise Invasion. I don't know. What do you guys think? Did you like all these shows that I talked about? Did you watch any of them? Let me know in the comments section down uh, below. Very interested in finding out. As for me, I've talked for way too long. This is a super long video. Uh, thank you everybody for tuning in. God bless. Uh, stay safe out there. I will catch all of you.
our next video. Thank you.